Okay. All right, today is November 2nd, it is five o'clock and in accordance with the governor's executive order, this is a special virtual meeting of the Keisha Farm Committee. Um, I wanna welcome Sue Bettino to our group tonight. She is the, I'm gonna say executive director, you can correct me, of the Newton Community Farm in Newton, Massachusetts. It's the second time she's come to talk to us. And the, at the first, begin, two years ago, we were just beginning this process and now we're at almost at the point where we're going to try and recommend an option to our town council. It's seated in front of you. You're going to see members of the committee. So, um, Sue, you'll see Pam Rowe is here, Jim um, Woodworth, and Jenna Golis are also committee members. Mary Breton on the screen is our um, extraordinary secretary and great advisor on the committee. Bonnie Therian is our town manager. And then the three gentlemen that you see are members of the University of Hartford consultant team that have been working with us now for two semesters and a summer to try to gather information and put it in a kind of a coherent format. And they're gonna be making a presentation to our town council on December 6th, as are we. So um, I'm gonna start out with some of the questions. And then Alex and I have talked pr uh, prior to this about the topics. And then if you don't mind, it, it's just gonna be like question answer, if, if that's okay with you, Sue. That's okay. Okay, that's terrific. All right, so what we're looking for now is how do we present a realistic reuse of this property with revenues and expenses that are financially plausible? All right, so we want to start out how with your relationship with the city of Newton. Uh, we know you're a 501c3. How, did that, how does that look? your relationship? Do they have any governance over you or are you completely independent of them? So uh, I'm not sure exactly how your situation is, but for us at the farm, um, the city of Newton purchased the land that is Newton Community Farm in 2005. It was privately owned um, previously uh, by a family and the city was able to purchase it by using Conservation uh, Preservation Act funds. And it is deed restricted to remain um, open, you know, open space. There are several things it could be. Um, it's got a conservation deed and a nonprofit called the Newton Conservators um, make sure that we are keeping it a farm. So uh, we have a license with the city of Newton to use this property and manage a farm on it. The city owns the property, it owns all the buildings. And then the Newton conservators, because of the deed restriction, they come by once a year and do sort of a, um, a physical audit where we walk around the farm with them and tell them what's new, what isn't new. So as far as the city goes, anything we want to do with the buildings beyond routine maintenance, we have to you know, work with them on. For example, we just co-applied for a grant to get solar power on the, the barn roof. We couldn't do that on our own because we don't own the building. Our license goes until 2031. Obviously, hopefully these panels will be there longer than that. But we could apply for it because we were a farm and it was a farming grant. So sometimes we do things together with the city. Um, the day-to-day -day operations of the farm, that's all up to us. We don't get any money from the city and we don't give them any money. We don't pay any rent and they don't, uh, we're not in the budget for the city. So our um, employees, our staff, everything, our volunteers, all that is run by the nonprofit. Are you able to do your own hiring? Yes, we do all our own hiring. We're not city employees. So we, we hire people, we oversee all the HR stuff that uh, we're completely independent from the city. And where, if you don't mind, how many employees do you have and how many volunteers do you have to run the farm? Sure, we have um, three full-time year-round employees, myself, our farm manager and our education uh, director. And then we have um, an assistant farmer who works full-time from March until November. And then we have seasonal staff that work part-time um, pretty much June and on. We have a farm stand manager who works June to November. We have an intern supervisor who just works um, July and August with student interns. Sometimes we hire additional um, field crew, which is seasonal when it's super busy 
in uh, sometimes in March and April when we're planting all the seeds, and sometimes um, in the height of picking in July and August when all the tomatoes come in and it gets kind of crazy here. So we have anywhere um, from three, just the three of us over the winter to I'd say maybe 11 staff would be our highest, maybe, maybe 10. And then volunteers, in the summer months we offer shifts. Um, so people can come in and volunteer on a Saturday from 10 to noon, just anybody. Anybody who's interested goes to Sign Up Genius and they come in and we teach them what needs to be done and they help us. And we have four people at a time for that. We used to have more, but with COVID we, we are keeping it pretty small still to four. We have tons of volunteers when we have our seedling sale. Um, we just had a 15th anniversary party. We had a kid's party. So we had about 10 volunteers for that. So I'd say in a year, I actually need to figure this number out for our, um, our uh, accountants. Um, so you've got me thinking it's, it's probably, uh, it's definitely 60 or maybe 75 volunteers. But because we're such a tiny farm, you guys are lucky that you're gonna be a big farm. We can't have too many people on at any given time. There's just nowhere to put people. We're hemmed in by two roads on a corner and we're two and a half acres. So we, don't, we can't get corporations to bring a group or department from somewhere, even though people would like to. Pretty much six to eight people at a time is, is our max unless we're having a special event. Not, not to get too far into the weeds, but you contract with a farmer to live on the land as your farm manager and to organize the farm itself. Do you have a, a residence for that manager? Yes, um, we, he's not a contract employee. He's a regular um, full-time salaried employee. And we're lucky that this property has um, a farmhouse that was built in the 1800s um, and the farm manager, it's written into the license that the farm, or I think it's that the farm manager, that someone will live on, on the premises to oversee um, the farm. Because oftentimes, you know, things that need to be done, you know, super early in the morning to start harvesting in the summer and late at night, he's closing up the um, produce pickups for the CSA program. And, you know, on Saturdays, he's loading up to go to the farmer's market. <coughs> It's good security to have someone here on the farm. We also don't at the moment have um, active heat or ventilation in our greenhouse. So he has to run out, open the doors on hot days and close, get the eggs from the chickens, you know, so we really need somebody to be here. He also is the caretaker of the land itself. So he beats back all the uh, poison ivy and, you know, plows and all that sort of thing. So we're lucky that we're able to have somebody live on site. Is that part of his compensation as well, the, the uh, ability to live in the farmhouse with his family? Depends who you ask. The way it's it was written up was that um, in exchange for being the, um, the groundskeeper and keeping an eye on the property, um, he has the, uh, the permission to use the uh, farmhouse. So it's not directly tied to his job as the farm manager. It's sort of seen as a, a separate thing. Although over the years, it's come to be seen as, well, you know, no one in farming gets paid a lot. And a perk you have is that you get to live here. So, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of a blurry line. And he pays his own expenses. He pays for his own electricity and he... No, the nonprofit pays for that. We pay for, he pays his own personal expenses, you know, right. but we pay for um, electric, water, sewer, all that kind of stuff. I hope you don't mind me asking, but we do have a farmhouse as well. So I'm- Oh, we're good very, for you. We're very interested in how that might work, renting to a farmer. That's um, amazing. When you spoke to us two years ago, your initial contract with them was one year and then three years, and then you kept extending it as you grew more comfortable on the relationship. Is that, an is that an accurate description? No, you're talking about the license for the whole farm with the city. It was initially, I think it was a two or three year program um, to have Newton Community Farm Inc. run the farm. And then it got extended and it got extended again. And then it, the big leap happened where now it's extended through 2031. Uh, the farmer is, he's never been on a contract. He's salary and we've been lucky to have him since the beginning of this farm. So he, it's at will, you know, but we, we, will hopefully have him working here longer and he will hopefully want to be here longer. So he's been here, it'll be his 16th year. You're lucky to find somebody. That's great. 
All right, Alex and U of H team, is there anything else you want to ask about the relationship with the city or employees and volunteers? All right. All right. Um, I did have a question about the salary. Um, is Does the nonprofit pay the farmer salary? Is yes. that how? Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I'm kind of been running this from the University of Hartford side for the last uh, year. So um, I've done a lot of research on your farm, read your annual reports um, and all that good stuff. Um, so one, thank you for being so organized. It makes, it makes my job easier. Um, in terms of kind of stepping back a little bit and actually getting started, I assume you were involved from kind of like the get-go, um, kind of where, where the Keisha Farms project is right now, right? Like we're, we're proposing a few different ideas based off of the community wants um, to the town council. So I'm interested in kind of going back um, you know, you, you talk about how the city didn't fund you any money and you don't fund them any money. Um, you know, obviously, whenever you begin something, there's overhead associated with that. So I'm interested, was that grants, funding, um, and, and how did you go about that? So I, I have not been here since the beginning. Um, I, I can tell you uh, what I know from those, those days. Um, so initially when the building was, uh, the property was gonna be turned over to be used as the farm, um, it was in pretty bad shape. Um, the barn was actually condemned because there was uh, structural repairs needed on the inside. Uh, the farmhouse had lead paint. Um, there was a lot of work that needed to be done. So in order for the farmer to be able to live there, um, since that's a, a condition of the uh, license, you need to have somebody on site. Um, I don't know how exactly how it came about, but the city had to get the buildings in usable, inhabitable space. I think, you know, whenever you're going to um, move into something, you have to be able to get a certificate of occupancy. So I believe that, you know, the city was um, required to bring things up to code um, and make it habitable. There were volunteers I know that did a lot of work ripping wallpaper down and there was a ton of um, metal and junk and old machinery in the barn as you would have on a farm that had been around for hundreds of years. So little by little that got taken out, some by the city, some by the farmer um, got recycled. So it was a process, but I think, you know, stipulations were made before Newton Community Farming started um, operating the farm that the building and the barn had to be in usable condition. That may have had something to do with the fact that we had to preserve it as a, as a farm. And so, you know, it had to be usable. Um, and also that, that we had to have somebody live in the farmhouse. So that had to be usable. Um, I don't know all the nitty gritty details of that. But one thing that I will say, which I mentioned when, when I talked last time to this group, it's very, very important that when you um, put together your original agreements, you consider what's, what is called maintenance and what is called repair, improvement, um, uh, major maintenance. We are coming upon this problem because we had such a short-term contract initially and so nobody really thought about, well, who's going to pay when the roof needs to be replaced or who's going to pay when the boiler stops working in the middle of winter, which happened. Um, and because in our contract, it says that we will be a self-sustaining entity um, and we will do routine maintenance. It's, it's not a clear line. We do routine maintenance. We take care of if a pipe bursts, if um, the deck on the barn has needed to be replaced because of rotting wood, you know, we do tree trimming, we pay for a lot of things. But when it came time to replace the boiler last year because it stopped working, um, it was a big question. And, you know, especially during COVID, city budgets are tight. And our city has um, different relationships with many, many, many nonprofits in our town. So, they don't want to set any precedent of doing work on this property if, because then everyone will come out from every art center and church and historical and uh, library and say, well, you know, we need a new boiler, you know, because everybody has needs and no nonprofit is uh, rolling in the dough as far as I know. So I think that it's very, very important to take that into account to get the buildings when you receive the buildings to use that they're in usable good condition and that it's very clearly um, outlined in any agreements 
not just who will do routine maintenance, but what is routine maintenance? And what is the, the responsibility of the municipality? Is it gonna be like repairs over a certain amount? Is it gonna be, how are you gonna consider um, and define what's gonna be taken care of by the nonprofit and what's gonna be go back to the city? Because you know it could bankrupt a nonprofit to try to do repairs on a 300 year old uh, uh, farmhouse. What we are ending up doing now because uh, nobody wants to give is uh, we are going to the Conservation Preservation Commission again to try to get funding and it seems like our best path. This is they give money for restoration of historical buildings and um, it's all money that's paid through taxes. So we're hoping to get some funds to do some bigger projects on the farmhouse that you know are very expensive and not routine maintenance. Great advice, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I guess my next question is, as you were talking about that, um, I, I know Noah, who is at least on my screen below me, he's an insurance major, I'm an insurance minor. Um, when you're talking about cleaning up junk and having people come onto the property to do things like that, or even just having your full-time um, you know, farmer employee, I just think about all the possible liability um, associated with those tasks. Do you have your own insurance? Is that from the city? I'm interested in that. We have our own insurance through, um, it's called uh, Farm Family. There's specific um, insurers that um, have packages for farms. Um, I feel like I might have forwarded this information. I'm not sure, but um, it's called American Farm Family. And I, I don't know exactly what there is in your area, um, if that's a national thing or not, but I know there are specific insurers that work with farms. So you wanna get good farm insurance, both for um, you know, the, 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 using the property, having volunteers on the property, farmers work with sharp tools, you know, there's pretty high incidence of injury. So yeah, we don't have any, we're not in any way covered by, um, by the city for any of that, like our fire, um, fire detection, uh, um, smoke alarms, our sprinkler, all that stuff we, is our responsibility. Okay, great. Thank you very much for uh, kind of explaining that in depth. Um, just a few more. So in terms of, um, sorry, I lost that. In, in terms of the grants that you have, I assume, applied for in the past, are those written totally just by your separate entity? There's, there's just, there's no relationship to the city? Is that correct? Everything except for the most recent solar grant. Um, like I said, that one was for sort of a, a capital improvement project on a, on a building not owned by us. So that had to be a co-application. But everything else, like we applied for a grant for some equipment and that was just, I just wrote that. Um, we got grant, we have grants for, um, that help us cover the cost of donating produce that we would otherwise sell. We have a produce donation program. So we had a, a couple banks and a foundation that help, um, help pay for that. I'm trying to think what else. Um, other banks, yeah, it's all, it's all just through us. And do you have a committee that works on that? A dedicated committee that works on writing grants with you or is it you? A committee, committee of one? We're okay. very small, yeah. We're very small, I've learned a lot. You can learn a lot about, I had never applied for a grant in my life until two years ago and it's a pretty fast process to learn. And um, once you know your organization, um, a lot of the grants ask the same questions. What is your organization? Like how many people are on that 501c3 board? So on our board right now, we have eight people. We'd like to grow it more. Um, you know, from what I've learned, it's best practices to have an odd number for disagreements and things like that. So we'd like to grow it to at least nine, maybe 11 people. We have a board president, and then we also have a treasurer and a, a, um, a clerk, recording secretary. So those are the officers. Um, and then every, uh, you can, you can be on the board for a three-year term and you can do that twice. And we used to say that after six years, you had to roll off the board and then you could come back later if you wanted, but it would give other people a chance to 
have a shot. What we're finding now is that um, it's hard to find board members. People are really busy and, uh, you know, it's a commitment. It's not a huge commitment, but it's a, it's a big commitment. And so now we're talking about maybe giving people the opportunity to stay on after those six years on a year by year basis. Because after you've been on for six years, you have so much historical knowledge about how things work and to just lose people just because it's an arbitrary six year number, it's painful, especially like our treasurer is coming up on six years and we don't wanna let her go. And she might stay on if she didn't think she was pinned in for three or six more years. So this is something that the board is talking about. I'm not on the board, but I attend all the board meetings and I'm the voice of the farm. I, I'm the liaison for all the things that have happened with um, you know, anything that the staff reports to me and everything that we've done over the past month. I relate to the board and, and they ask me questions. So I have to, I have to submit a, um, a summary the Friday before the board meeting and then they can ask questions. And then we have our meetings once a month. And did the city of Newton have to approve of your mission statement when you created your 501c3? Did, was that part of your agreement with them in the license that you would create a nonprofit and they would have some input on it? You know what? I'm not 100% sure about that. I don't think so. I believe what happened was um, because our first focus was to have it be a production farm. And then we realized that in order to get a 501c3 status, we had to have the educational component, which we'd always planned to have. That was, that was part of our mission, but that was a little looser at the time. But when we applied for a 501c3 strictly as a farm, I believe we didn't get it. We had to reapply and express the educational component of what we were going to be doing. And then we got the 501c3 status. And I, I would assume that we had to have our mission organized to you know, get picked by the city, but no one was competing with us. You know, we, we had been working with the city along the way to just like you are to become the nonprofit that ran the farm. So um, I think we had our mission already set, but the 501c3 status came a little bit later once we made the educational component stronger. Would you mind just explaining that educational component to us? That's a, a it seems to have been something that the community is very interested in here. Yeah, oh, good. Good. Yeah, it's a great learning opportunity for everyone. Um, you know, this is why we're here. We model and we teach. We also teach by modeling what we do. So um, formally, we have a director of education and we have classes on the farm for kids and adults. Um, for example, this summer, we had summer classes for elementary age children, and they came for two hours a day, five days a week. In the past, we run camp, but we had to cancel camp during COVID and that was so difficult and we didn't really know what was going to happen this year. So we decided to do classes instead. And honestly, that was a, a great decision, much less stressful for everyone involved. Um, we have one time classes where you can come and like learn how to how to pickle vegetables or learn how to make jam or um, we've had book groups in the past where everyone has the same cookbook that they review and each person brings an item that they cooked from a recipe in the cookbook. And if you don't like to cook, then you pay $10 and everybody would share. This was pre-COVID. Um, we've had a lot of online classes in the past year and a half, which are usually, I think all of them were for free. You can make a donation if you wanted to, but we had like a a class on square foot gardening, teaching you how you how much you can grow in one square foot of space. And then you can multiply that by the amount of space you have. This was a class for low income seniors who were getting some um, room to make a garden through the Newton Housing Authority. So we also have had cooking and baking classes for adults and for families in the past. Um, right now, none of our classes involve eating. Um, because of COVID and everything we tried to do outside. We also go offsite. So um, our director of education right now on Thursdays, he's going to a private Jewish school nearby where he teaches the after school kids about gardening once each week for an hour. Um, we have groups that come here. We have a Montessori school that comes once a week and we do tours. We've had the Girl Scouts come and all, all different groups have come for tours, educational tours. And then the last thing we do with that is we try to include an educational component in our events. So we just had a kid's um, fall party. So part of it was a scavenger hunt where you had to go and learn things about the farm as you walked around and looked for different 
leaves and plants and uh, chickens and things like that. So, so we had to sort of pause our educational programming, at least in person for the past year and a half. So we didn't pick that back up until this summer with in-person classes, but um, it's great. I mean, there's nothing like having people on the farm and little kids running around and, you know, learning things and having multi-generational groups here to share together. We've done a historic farm tour in conjunction with Newton Historic Association in the past, and that's been wonderful. There's just always something to learn here. And because we're here for the community, we want the community to come here. And it, last year was very difficult. So now our new focus, instead of having big events, like we used to have a fall festival with 800 people and 800 people on less than two acres is pretty tough. And, uh, you know, we had a dinner at the farm, sit down dinner, and it was fancy and catered and like 150 people came. Now we're changing the focus to be more small events where people can get together. It's more casual. The party we just had was a taco truck and some music and a silent auction. And it was all outside for a couple hours. And it was great. It was great. Tickets were $35 or $36. Um, you know, the fall party, we limited it to 25 kids. We could have crammed 100 kids in here, but it's just too much. We're trying to be very um, risk averse right now and just um, bring people together in smaller groups. Um, can Are you all of your going... events? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alex. I, I was just going to ask about the Friends of the Farm. Um, is that just the volunteers that you have or is that something completely different? So Friends of the Farm is the, is the name that the creators of the farm um, decided to call anybody who's donated a certain amount or more each year. So in order to be part of some of the programs here, you need to be a friend of the farm. Um, right now, the minimum donation is $50 in a year. It goes from November 1st, and then it kind of goes to December 31st the following year. There's a little overlap in there. Um, Part of that is to get, you know, it's to get donations. Another part is to get people invested and, you know, thinking about, you know, the farm and where their money goes and making a commitment. Um, we don't have a membership. Some places have memberships. The, the founders of this farm were very specific about saying we didn't want to say that it was a membership organization because members only implies um, you know, that people are being excluded. If you're not a friend of the farm, you, you can't do certain things like get a CSA membership, but you can still go to our farm stand. You can still go to the farmer's market. You can still have access to all the same produce that anybody else does. It's just a, a you know, a different way of doing it. So that's why they called it friends of the farm. Um, I call everybody our friends of the farm, you know, and, you know, I would love to do away with having certain levels and, but that seems to be pretty typical of all nonprofits that people want to donate. They like having suggested amounts. Sometimes we tie it to like discounts on different programs or one year we did it where you got a free t-shirt if you gave a certain amount. Lately, I haven't been doing that. I just feel like it's for us, it's too much accounting and too hard to keep track of because our accounting software is, leaves a lot to be desired. So it gets hard to figure out in a household how many people gave and who gave what amount. Was it, did it reach this threshold? So forget it. If you want to donate, here's some suggested amounts and some people use them. A lot of people use the $50 minimum because they want to be in the CSA. And other than mm. that, you know, it, it's, it's pretty loose. Yeah. yeah, Sue, thanks so much for coming. This is so interesting. I feel like a class trip is in order, you know? Yeah. Uh, hmm. I was just curious, and this is, maybe this is a silly question, but with a farmer living in the house, um, had there ever been thought of life use of the house as long as he's the farmer and he be responsible for his own property, for the house, the heater, the roof? Or does he not make enough money on the farm through your organization to do those things? Yeah, no, it, it's never been an option. It's, um, it's not a property that he owns or that we own. And so to make large improvements on it and then move away from it, because, you know, he won't be here forever. I don't, you know, he doesn't have the asset of owning the house. So I don't think that it was ever considered that he would take on the, um, those kinds of repairs. 
Um, the house was in livable condition when he bought it, but you know, there were things that obviously still needed work and still do need work to this day, 15 days, 15 years later. And that all started, you know, back in the 1800s when the house was built with the foundation and that sort of thing. So we never really considered that his wage doesn't include um, any consideration of that. And also my last question, where are you in relation to the Newton campus or Boston College? Oh, I'm we're trying right to in it. We're right are. in it. It's all around really? us. Yeah, wow. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's all around Newton and, and Brookline and this area. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got to go see. <laughs> come visit. It sounds, it sounds wonderful. You're welcome to come. Uh, this I, is Bonnie. Just so everyone knows, we have the same relationship with, um, or I think we still do, with the person in Solomon Wells' house. So we take care of Solomon Wells, but there's a person there who kind of, uh, you know, does some caretaking a little bit for that house that um, just pays, helps towards utilities. But, yeah. So we have a similar relationship in a written document already. Yeah, what I'm finding about Newton is that, you know, no two nonprofits have the same relationship with the city. Some are able to say, well, this window is le leaky or drafty. They put in a ticket with the city and the city sends a city worker out and they fix that window. And, mm -hmm. and then I, I die of envy. Ours is not the same. We have a leaky window, we, we have to fix it, you know? So, I mean, don't listen, Bonnie, but the rest of you try to make it so that the city is as responsible as possible for oh, things that go oh, wrong. You're killing me, Sue, you're killing because me. Because things will go wrong. Things will go wrong. Even if it's given to you in great condition, you know, Things wear out, things go wrong, and hopefully your farm will be around for a long time and you'll have to think about some of these bigger issues. Okay, Bonnie, you can listen again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been trying to listen to all your revenue sources and write them down because as we try and present a realistic scenario to our community. So I've been, I wrote down, you have a farm stand. Is that open every day? The farm stand this year is open Thursday and Friday afternoons and Saturday mornings. And all so, the money goes to the nonprofit. Yes. All the yeah. money from the I mean, you know, we have to pay all the things yeah. that we have to pay for, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We have the farm stand brings in money, the CSA, we have a summer CSA with 80 shares. And then we have a fall CSA that usually has 40 shares. This year, we only have 30 because of all the rain this summer. We weren't able to plant something. Some things we planted just drowned. So um, so that money comes in. And how uh, much is it here? The, the full shares for the summer are, I think they're um, 670. It's 20 weeks of produce. And then there's a half share option. It's all on our website. That's a little bit more than half of the cost and you come for 10 weeks, you come every other week. And then the fall, I honestly don't remember off the top of my head because once we, we register everyone, I, I, it's, got, it's gone until the next time I have to think about it. But again, it's all on our website. We leave it up year round for information. Um, so that's our biggest boost. Then we do, we do a fruit share program, with, like I said, where we bring in fruit from an orchard nearby and they charge us an amount, we tack on a, fee, you know, for having it all here and, and registering people and everything. So we make a little money off of that. We, some years we do the same with a flower share with another farm. Unfortunately, the farm that we share, do that share with had a big fire back in the spring. So they weren't able to um, do their flower share this year. What else do we make money on? We go to the farmer's market, 17 Saturdays from June through October. So we had to make the decision, which hopefully you guys are gonna have so much land, you won't have this problem, but we can only grow so much. I can grow, I can sell everything we grow. We can sell it. The problem is if it all goes to the farmer's market, there's nothing left for the farm stand and vice versa. The biggest problem we have is figuring out how to parse it out, not selling it. People always say, oh, I, I have an idea for you. I'm like, we got it. We've sold everything because we don't, we don't grow a lot and people really like what we grow. So. Our problem is figuring out how to distribute it. So that's why our farm stands only open three days a week. If we were open more than that, we wouldn't have enough food to donate and enough food to sell at the, at the farm stand and enough for our CSA shares. So that's the thing we have to really um, work on. And then 
we also bring in money through our education programs. Our summer program is the bulk of that, but our classes and our tours and, and things like that. I'm trying to think, we sell a tiny bit to a restaurant in town. That's definitely gone downhill since COVID. Um, but there, there have been, has been a restaurant or two that buys some particular things, tiny, tiny, tiny carrots and certain things that they like to have. So you might have that option as well to do either wholesale or retail. You know, some restaurants will just pay, pay retail because they want to be able to say this is local fresh produce right from here and they don't have to pay shipping and distribution and all that kind of thing. Did you mention special events too? Do you charge? Oh yeah, we do. Yes. I'm sorry, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, when we have an event, like when we had our 15th anniversary party, we charge for tickets. Mm -hmm. Our seedling sale, we, we make some money. Who knows how much we make on that because it's an incredible amount of labor to grow all those um, uh, seedlings. But, uh, and then the electricity to heat the heat mats that we use and all, all that kind of stuff but um, our ceiling sale. And then um, in the past, like I said, we've had a fall festival. That was a free event, but people paid to do different activities like pumpkin decorating and um, buying apples and cider donuts and things like that. So is your budget on the, the website? It's not. Our budget is around, you know, it's varied. I think the last time I talked to Cindy, we were at around $410,000. It's definitely gone down since then. Uh, I think for next year, we're projecting about 335, 345, something like that. Because, um, you know, our education program has changed. Our in-person events are, like I said, going to be smaller. Um, so that's affected what we bring in. And so that's affected what we're able to spend. Do you have any rentals? I mean, is there any part of your property that's for rent as an income source? No, we just don't have the space. Okay. We have had inquiries. The most recent one was someone who wanted to put his like um, 18 wheeler um, container. You know how some people do these container gardens, not like on your porch, but like a huge container from a truck and they do hydroponics in there. So there was an inquiry about that. There are always people looking for places for um, farmers to live even like tiny houses. I know one farm, they have a tiny house on their property for their farmer because they don't have a farmhouse. But that definitely would be an idea of a way to bring in some income if you have the space. And then the other thing we do is write lots of grant applications and applications to foundations. I write lots of letters asking for sponsors for events or projects, um, mostly to banks. So, um, I think a lot, if we were a bigger farm, we'd definitely have someone dedicated just to fundraising. And then we do our individual um, contributions where we send out letters in the spring and the fall um, to um, prospective donors, first by snail mail and then by email. So you need to grow your, um, you know, grow your mailing list, which you will do. Um, and I think that's I where all our money comes from. Hmm? Oh. I'm sorry, you mentioned no, no. cooking. Do you have a kitchen that you're, is available to your the, the community? We do have a kitchen. When they renovated the barn um, with uh, CPA funds and uh, private donations in 2013, they renovated this barn that we're in. I'm upstairs in the little office, which is like a loft in the barn. And right underneath me is a, is a commercial kitchen. So every year we get that permitted and um, someone on our staff needs to have like safe serve and allergen awareness um, certifications and then they can teach cooking and baking and, and they can travel around and do that too. And what kind of um, what kind of grant or funding did you get for that? I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Oh, it, um, we used CPA funds, Conservation Preservation Act funds, which is what we're applying for again to fix up the farmhouse. I don't know what it would be called if it's if there's a counterpart to that in Massachusetts, but it's something that is paid um, by taxpayers to preserve um, open space, affordable housing, and historical buildings. Okay. So you can apply to get money out of there. So that's what they did here in 2013. They started renovating this barn and they did it in two phases. And that was again between the city and the nonprofit because it's a city building. But the nonprofit ended up being on site the most. So, you know, we did a lot of the project management. 
Um, and then we also had a family that donated a substantial amount of money, uh, history in this area um, to renovating this barn. So we were very lucky. Our barn is basically three levels. The basement is where all the, all the vegetable workings happen, where everything gets, you know, like rinsed and that's where the cooler is and all the tools are and the benches and all the piping for the sprinklers and everything. And then the middle level is just an open space, which we had thought about renting out in the past. I don't know what your, what your building looks like if you have a barn, but briefly we had rented it for a few things like speaking engagements or parties, uh, birthday parties, things like that. I think some fraternity had a party here once, but then COVID happened and we just, uh, it's not really a great space for renting because it's small and we also use it to store equipment. So it doesn't look very nice if you wanted to have a fancy party here. But I, that was initially the idea was that we had a kitchen, we could make food and we could have parties here. Um, we'll see if that ever happens. All right, fantastic. Does anyone have any other questions or thoughts that have been uh, kind of sparked? No, by? nobody wants to have a wedding or anything there on that it's second too, floor? It's too tiny, really. I mean, you could have, you could have maybe like, well, with pre-COVID, you could probably fit 30 guests in here. But with COVID, you know, we'd have to make it so that it could be outside. And then what if it rains? You'd have to have a tent. Believe me, every event, I'm like, oh, if only we had our own tent company and our own, you know, catering company. And we're some so small that some things just don't quite happen. Some parents might be thrilled to know they could only have 30. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Alex and the U of H team, anything else you're thinking of, you know, in terms of trying to present a realistic, plausible scenario to the town council? Right. No, I, uh, I, I honestly think we have some great information um, that we can go and kind of, you know, combine that with some of the research we've already done. Um, but thank you very much, um, Sue, for, you know, being here and answering all of our questions. Sure. And um, Cindy and Bonnie have my email address if anybody has any follow up questions or you need anything else from me just just let me know I'm happy to help. Keep me posted. I want to know what happens. I want to echo every, all the other comments too to thank you for coming back here tonight. Sure. And, uh, Anytime. I'm sure you'll have more questions. So feel free to reach out again. We'll be happy to share the presentation with you too, just so you know oh, what we're what we're hoping you know, to, to present to our community about what people want to see on this property. So yeah, yeah, great. Well, it's a learning experience. I mean, you just learn as you go. And then once you learn, everything changes and you learn all over again. So <laughs> great. All right. Well, take care, you guys. All right. Thank, thank you. you. I'll thank be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Bye. Bye now. All right. And anybody last comments? I mean, that was so so much great information to kind of help us focus a little bit. Alex, just, just a follow-up to last night. If Bonnie is going to include anything in the town council packet, which is what the counselors get prior to the meeting, she has to have it by November 30th, which, which puts a little pressure on us because there's Thanksgiving and everything there too. So we all have to have our part done so that we can bounce it off each other before we give it to Bonnie in its finished form so she can include it in the council packet. So keep those, keep that in mind. It's like the next three weeks. Can we have a dry run from STEM oh, to yes. STEM? Okay. Yep. yep. Definitely. And also, Cindy, we have to schedule that meeting, right, with the UHART crew prior to the town council meeting. <laughs> Exactly. That's why um, Alex wasn't on the, our meeting last night. So I'm reminding him, you know, we need prior to November 30th, we need to schedule that meeting so that we can all share with each other what we're going to say on December 6th. So Alex, you on your end, think of an evening that would work for you. And then I'll work with the committee and Bonnie to get a make sure we have a quorum and Pam and Mike and I can kind of coordinate what what we might be trying to convey as well. So yeah, let us minutes. know, Alex, when you think the your info is pretty much wrapped up and that'll be, you know, we could do it right after. Okay, that 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 sounds good. Um, I now that I kind of like the outlines kind of been approved, um, I can start to kind of gather our final thoughts and uh, and get back to you all. 
And in terms Great. of time, just five minutes for the Keisha Farm Committee, 15 minutes for you. And then a question if the counselors have any. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate yeah, it. I mean, that was... your dedication to this has been amazing. I'm, I'm so grateful. And uh, that was a lot of good info. So. Yeah, her place is wonderful. Two and a half do a road trip. Two and a half acres, and she they generate four hundred thousand dollars. So it is, it's inspiring. It's. it's I we'll just get I, there. Don't worry, we'll get there. I, I just didn't understand how the use of the farmhouse. You know, I just like Jim had said he knows people that would right live there and want to work the farm. Well, it would be that that's a having that house is a big benefit if you're going to lease to a farmer for sure. For In free, case, I mean, right? Pardon me. Well, they would be. I mean, you're you're getting a place to live at no yeah. cost to them. Yes, and and in this case, uh, if you hire a farmer, there are people out there. We'll have to we'll have to talk with Kip Kolasinskis once we get the next thing because that's what he does is a match up farmers and opportunities. And so if we if we get to that point with having a uh, nonprofit and, you know, fall this take shape, then he would be a person to to uh, help us find someone. <clears throat> you know, Alex and Esteban, while you're still on the call, the sooner you can tell us what people really were leaning towards in that survey, the better. Like, did they want farming? Did they want education? I mean, what were those choices? So the sooner the better, it will drive us in terms of what, what we can say based on data. Okay, great. All right, Most, do we need a motion to adjourn, Bonnie? Is it that serious? Yes, I would. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Jim and seconded by Jenna. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. That was a great meeting. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Cindy, are you still on?